Okay, and so um, moving on, we are so excited to have Professor Josh Bongard here today to speak with us. Um, Professor Bongard's research centers on the evolutionary robotics, evolutionary computation, and physical simulation. He runs the Morphology, Evolution, and Cognition Laboratory at UVM. The lab's work focuses on the role of morphology and evolution, and evolution play in cognition. All right. Uh, I work in the same department as Josh at UVM, and so not only do I get the honor of having him as a colleague, but also as a great role model. Um, so we're grateful to Josh for his commitment to science communication, education, and his innovative research. Josh, thank you for your interest and respect for the arts, and thank you for joining us today. Jen, and thanks, Lisa, and thanks to all of you for sticking around on this beautiful day. Just bear with me while we make some adjustments here. Okay, so um, nice to see all of you. I see a lot of faces I don't recognize, which is great. I also see a lot of faces I do recognize, a couple of former students. So for the technically inclined folks here, we're going to take things up a, a level and look at some of the connections between science uh, and art and also <clears throat> policy and regulation. So again, thanks to all of you for sticking around. I will do my best to try and reward your patience by uh, telling you what I hope you find a somewhat interesting story about the origins of the world's very first AI-designed organism. You can see that AI-designed organism on the right here. I will tell you a little bit about what they are and what they are not yet, or what they are not and what they are not yet. Um, before we dive in, it's a Saturday afternoon. Um, I'm a professor. I asked Chris how much time I had, and he said, whenever you're done. It's a very dangerous thing to say to professors. So I promise uh, we will chat for the next 45 minutes, and then I promise to shut up. Um, during that time, instead of me talking at you for 45 minutes, please raise your hand or shout out a question. Or There's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, we are not all technically inclined here. Uh, I am not an artist. Uh, so we are all at different disadvantages. It's a great opportunity to try and find some connections and think up some new ideas together. So please just raise your hand or shout out, no problem. Okay, so uh, I'm going to tell you about the world's first AI-designed organism, which you see on the right here. Here's uh, one of its cousins. This is also an AI-designed organism. <clears throat> what is an AI-designed organism? It is an organism that was designed by an artificial intelligence. This is unlike any other organisms that currently exist on this planet, including the organisms that are sitting here today, or any organisms that have ever existed on the planet before. All of those organisms are a result of Darwinian evolution. There are some other organisms which are genetically modified, and there's some sort of combination of natural creativity and human creativity this organism that you see here was created by a machine. It's an AI-designed organism. It's more commonly known these days as a xenobot. So I'll use xenobot uh, from here on out. What's a xenobot? Uh, it's a bot. In a way, it's a robot. It's a machine that's been designed not by someone, but by something, by an AI, to do something. In this case, this particular xenobot was designed to build copies of itself. You can see this Pac-Man-shaped xenobot in the center here, which is pushing these little white dots around. These little white dots are sticky, and they glom together. And if I let this video, if I show you another version of this video, it will eventually create something that looks and moves kind of like itself. What are these white dots? These white dots are genetically unmodified frog cells. They're taken from a particular frog species known as Xenopus lavis, or the African clawed frog, thus the name Xenobot. Xeno in Greek also means stranger or newcomer, so we thought that was also kind of a fun twist on the nickname for this uh, technology. Questions? Do you lock your laboratory at night? I'm not going to tell you where my lab is. Great question. Other questions? Uh, 
Yes. Uh, is there anything special about these particular frog cells? Uh, yes. Uh, Xenopus lavis is what's known as a model organism. It's been used by biologists for decades and decades, which means it's familiar to the scientists and it's also familiar to the regulators. Those members of the national administration, at least in this country, that decide what you can and can't do with a given organism. There are very clear rules what you can and can't do with Xenopus lavis, and I wouldn't be showing you this video if this wasn't something that you couldn't do with xenobots, or with these cells. Are these the same cells used in uh, Jurassic Park? Are these the same cells used in Jurassic Park? Great question, why Jurassic Park? Because the most famous quote, at least relevant for today from that movie is? Life finds a way, absolutely, right? So another great twist in retrospect, we're working with frogs here, right? AI designed frog bots. What could possibly go wrong, yeah? Okay. Julia, yes. Yeah, it's a great question. So what does the AI know about what these cells can and can't do? Maybe their limitations? We'll come back to that. We're gonna spend a few minutes diving into the technical details of Xenobots, but I just wanna make sure most of us here have a general sense of what we're talking about. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so the white dots that you see here, these are genetically unmodified Xenopus lavis cells. They're taken from early embryo, so basically frog egg. The frog egg that these cells were taken from were not able to grow into an adult. So there are arguably frogs that are giving their lives for this research. It's an important point. Question? Yep. It absolutely crosses my mind. You're, you mentioned the gray goo hypothesis. So anybody that read 80s and 90s and zeros and 10s and 20s sci-fi, there's usually in there somewhere the gray goo hypothesis. Some sort of AI or robot or biology mashup gets out of control and just makes more copies of itself until it covers the surface of the earth with gray goo. Yes, absolutely, great question. Uh, isn't that what it's designed to do? It is not designed to cover the earth with gray goo, but pretty close to make copies of itself. Why on earth would serious scientists, if you'll consider me a serious scientist, do such a thing? We'll also come back to that. Any other questions about what we're looking at? Great question. Um, at the moment, you're looking at one cell type, frog skin cells, yeah. We're gonna look at another xenobot in a moment. If I can operate PowerPoint. This xenobot on the right, you'll see red and green. Those are two different cell types. We'll come back to that. Other questions before we push on? Yes? Is the xenobot alive? Is the xenobot alive? I am not qualified to answer that question, but I hope you will all be part of that discussion. It is still ongoing. Is this an organism? Is this a robot? Is it alive? Is it not? If it's not alive and it's not an organism, then presumably we're free to do a lot of things to this thing. If it is alive and it is an organism, we're not so free to do whatever we want with this thing. It is, a, it is not a silly question, it's a philosophical question, but it, all, it is also a, an important question that is already leading to regulation around this technology. It's a very good question. Yeah, uh, so what was the goal of this experiment? There are many, and I, there's no way I'm gonna get through all of them today. We started with one goal, which is, can you do it? Can you get an AI to figure out how to take cells from an organism, rearrange them, and produce something that looks and acts nothing like the host organism? This does not, at least to me, look or act like a frog. Does the organism learn? The answer to that is we have absolutely no idea. We've watched 
hundreds and hours of this. Uh, I should start by saying uh, I am not a biologist. I am a computer scientist. So certain biology questions I'm going to punt because they're beyond my area of expertise. But I know from talking with my biology colleagues, they don't know whether these things are capable of learning. Frogs are capable of learning. Whether these things taken from frogs are capable of learning, that's a, that's a scientific question. What defines it as an organism? Again, biologists cannot degree, agree on a definition of organism. Some of our biology colleagues, more than happy to consider these organisms. Other biology colleagues, not happy to accept these as organisms. What would be yes or no? No one knows. There is an argument that's been going for, depending on how you count, thousands of years. I am going to refer to these as organisms, yes. Again, I'm not a biologist, so I'm probably not qualified to make that determination. You can call this whatever you want. We're going to look at some of the science of this, and you can come to your own conclusions, and that's part of what I hope you take away from today. Don't trust the experts, right? This is a brand new technology. Uh, I, the previous speaker was talking about ChatGPT. There are these aliens that are arriving on Earth that don't look and act a lot like things that we're used to pointing to and saying machine, robot, organism, human, non-human. This is difficult for, for all of us. In my personal opinion, not my professional opinion, is we should all be making those decisions, not the experts. Uh, how was the first AI-designed uh, organism created? It was designed by an AI, but built by a human being. And I may get to this today. We'll see. I'm glad you're asking so many questions. Maybe. We'll get to that. How many of these exist? How many of these exist? Um, at last count, uh, there are some being made today, so the number's changing. I'd say less than 1,000. We're probably approaching 1,000 at this point. Do they reproduce? You're watching one of them reproduce. It is making a copy of itself. Again, as pointed out, we could argue about whether this counts as reproduction or not, but this thing made from cells makes another thing made from cells that looks and acts not exactly like its parent, but close. If you want to call that reproduction, fine. If you don't, also fine. I have a, a little bit of a philosophy background. I've taken some philosophy courses. Uh, it just makes me interested to ask those kinds of questions. There's lots of technical challenges, opportunities here, but also a lot of fun philosophical uh, territory here. I find that interesting, part of the reason why I'm here today. Okay, more questions. Ah, okay, so first question is, does it consume nutrients? The answer is um, mostly no. These cells are taken from frog egg. Anything that comes from an egg, including us, you absorb nutrients from inside the egg. Where is all the nutrients inside an egg? It's not a trick question. We eat an egg, and, and some of us throw away one part of the egg because it's a little bit too much nutrients for us. The yolk, yeah? So inside these frog cells, at this part in development, so this is very early on in what would have been the life of this frog, there are very small bits of yolk inside the cells, and as these cells move about and do their thing, they're digesting it. So you can think about that small amount of yolk inside the cells as like a battery. And then the second part of the question was, how long do these things survive? They can run on yolk for about seven to 10 days. And then at that period, they will stop moving, and they basically just rot back into the background biota. So once you overcome that problem, gray goo. Once we overcome that problem, gray goo. <laughs> we'll see. Yes. So 
I won't back up, but this, the red-green one that you just saw, that was the world's first uh, computer des uh, AI designed organism. So that's from January 2020, a little over four years ago. And during that time, the AI that we've used to create them has changed. But at heart, that AI, again, if we get to it today, is basically a genetic algorithm, which the students were working with uh, this morning. It's just a very, very high-powered genetic algorithm. Question way in the back. I'm sure this works on your next slide. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm still happy to take questions, but let's move on. Okay. So as I just mentioned, very nice. Um, January 2020, we'd been actually working on this project for a long time to see whether we could get this to work. That, that's one of the cliches of science that is usually true. Nothing works. You try, you try, you try, fail, 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 fail. And then uh, in around Thanksgiving 2019, so about six months before we published this work, a few months before we published this work, my grad student at the time, Sam Kriegman, who's now a faculty member at Northwestern, came in and showed me this picture and then showed me it moving around and convinced me that this wasn't something they faked or they made it by hand. This is what the AI dreamed up. Actually, you can see the AI's idea on the left here. It doesn't look that different from the fishes we just saw a few minutes ago. This was the AI's idea. And this was the human's attempt to build it. And both of these things, again, maybe we'll get there, actually worked. It was Thanksgiving, and I was in Innovation Hall at UVM, and it was one of those very rare moments in your career where I just got up from my desk, went for a walk down the hall, and my, my legs were shaking. We weren't quite sure what we had, but we knew we had something new under the sun. Very exciting. It's not normally what happens in science, but, but one of those very rare moments. So Thanksgiving 2019, uh, we published this in a technical journal in January 2020, and the result was this. So as you can imagine, when you create AI-designed frog bots, you got to expect a little bit of, of public interest. At the time, uh, myself and the three other members of the Xenobots team, uh, I mentioned Sam Kriegman, who was my CS uh, PhD student, and our two biology colleagues, Mike Levin and Doug Blackiston at Tufts University. Here they are in a New York Times spread uh, down here. We were a little taken aback with the magnitude of the public response. We spent a couple of weeks basically just talking to reporters and doing nothing else. We, then we started to think, okay, yeah, it kind of makes sense, the magnitude uh, of response. We started to sift through everything that was coming in through major media outlets, social media, emails, death threats. There were death threats. And we started to sort of look at the landscape of how people were responding to our announcement and notice that public uh, responses seemed to be falling into three categories. The first category, which mostly came from young folks, was unmitigated excitement and exuberance. Here's a typical email that we received at the time. This one was from Amy, uh, a prospective 15-year-old uh, synthetic biology researcher. Uh, she had just learned about xenobots, and she was the most excited she'd ever been in her entire life. She felt a strong desire to change the world with xenobots and began reading technical articles. Uh, I tried to keep her out of my lab, and I failed, um, so I took her on as an intern. I had no choice, um, and she has since gone on to some amazing, uh, some amazing things. We got a lot of this, mostly from young folks. Second type of response we got were things like this. You can hop online, you can get a Xenobot hat, you can order Xenobot signature sneakers, uh, Xenobot t-shirts, Xenobot coffee mugs. I will point out that I have yet to see a single dollar in royalties from any of these <laughs> merchandise. Uh, I am not very business savvy. Third type of response that we got was this, fear, lots and lots of fear. Yeah. Again, maybe we weren't so surprised. Actually, this was the thing we were most expecting. So somebody already mentioned Jurassic Park, Terminator, HAL, uh, who are we missing? You know, you, you name it, we got it. The thing that was surprising to me is as you sifted through a lot of it, and you sifted out the conspiracy theories and the gray goo hypothesis and all the rest, what was left still seemed to be that most people were very confident in their assessment 
that xenobots someday, sooner or later, were going to rise up and wipe out humanity. I was surprised at how confident people were. And once all the sort of media circus died down and we had some time to think about it, it occurred to me that for most of us, our early education and maybe our only education in what robots and AI are and what they might do for us or might do to us, our education comes from one source. This source, Hollywood, yeah? How many of you have taken an undergraduate class in robotics or AI? Couple. Grad classes? All right, pretty, actually, this is above average on what you would see, right? So this, to me, was, again, personally, not professionally, a little bit surprising. I understand people freaking out, but they were confident in how they thought all this was going to end, yeah? Um, I wasn't the first to think about this. Um, many of you probably remember Carl Sagan. For those who don't, he was a very world-renowned uh, cosmologist, a very gifted science communicator, and also a very committed citizen who was worried at the time about where he thought his society was going. As always, Carl said it best. We've arranged our civilization to be heavily dependent on science and technology, but at the same time, at least in this country, we've organized our educational system so that most of us are not very educated about science and technology at all. For Carl, this was a recipe for disaster. Not this disaster, but these kinds of disasters. This is a quote from a US politician a few weeks ago. ChatGPT taught itself to do advanced chemistry. It wasn't built into the model. Nobody programmed it to learn complicated chemistry. It decided to teach itself, then made its knowledge available to everyone who asked, something is coming and we're not ready. Almost everything in this tweet is wrong, except for the, maybe the last two statements, possibly. You'll notice there's nothing like, I think maybe, or I'm not a chemist, but I believe that these are statements of fact. Not to pick on this particular US politician, but this, this is the norm, right? Statements about what technology is or isn't, what's going to happen, without any actual background in what's going on. What I think about how Xenobots should be regulated doesn't matter. What Elon Musk thinks about how ChatGPT should be regulated doesn't matter. There are leaders, many of them, who are going to decide how and whether to regulate technologies, AI technologies, synthetic biology technologies. Hopefully, citizens plus our leaders will make informed decisions about what we want to let loose in our society. I hope. The only way to make an informed decision is to know a little bit about the science and technology that you're trying to regulate. There's no shortcut. It's a very, very long lead up to what we're going to do next, which is we're going to spend 20 minutes on a guided tour through the engine room of Xenobot technology. I'm going to show you how AI makes Xenobots. I'll show you a little bit about what they can currently do, what they can't do for 20 minutes, and we'll come back up for air, and I'll show you some more cool videos of Xenobots in action. My hope is that you might learn a little bit about this technology. You may or may not have any say in whether xenobots are regulated. But you, or maybe the next generation, should have a lot to say about whatever's coming next, next year, next decades. Hopefully, we can start to try and create a cultural norm around learning a little bit about what's happening in terms of science and technology and trying to come to an informed decision about it. Deal? 20 minutes? No math. I promise no math. 20 minutes, here we go. Okay, so for the Gen Xers in the room, we're gonna go behind the Terminator mask. For the millennials, we're gonna take the red pill and see how deep the rabbit hole goes. For those that are here that are a little bit young at heart, we are gonna look behind the wizard's curtain and see whether there's any magic there or if there's any magic there at all, yeah? Okay, here we go. Before we talk about AI-designed organisms, we have to talk about AI first. What is AI? We've got 20 minutes, so we're going to go very quickly, very lightly over the details. Most AI has an eye, a brain, and a mouth. 
The eye is the input. Imagine we take a picture of a cat and we supply it to an untrained AI. Doesn't know anything yet. Doesn't know about cats, dogs, humans, xenobots, nothing. All the AI sees is a whole bunch of colored, a whole bunch of colors, colored pixels. The AI's task is to tell us whether or not there's a cat in this image or not. It knows nothing, so what's the best thing to do if you know nothing? Make a guess. The AI is going to take all those numbers that represent all those colors, randomly mix them together, compress them into fewer and fewer numbers, and as it's doing this random mixing and compressing, it's going to remember every step, everything it did. It's still doing it randomly, but it's remembering. When it gets to the end, we're going, we, the human observers, are going to look at these two numbers represented by these two boxes here. If the second box, the second number, is larger than the first number, if it's 8.2 here and 7.4 here, that's the AI's way of telling us it thinks there's a dog in this image. If you make a random guess and you only have two possible guesses, cat or dog, you're going to be wrong 50% of the time. Yeah? In this case, it's wrong. We're showing it a cat. It thinks it's a dog. So the, we tell the AI it was wrong, and now what the AI is going to do is take its mistake and go backwards. It's going to go backwards through its brain to its eye. And as it goes, it's basically unwinding or reversing all these random mixings and compressions that it did, and it's watching to see where it might have made a mistake. Imagine you take a math exam, and you get back your grade from the instructor. You got an F but you did kind of okay over here. If you're a conscientious student, you take your exam and you go backwards through the exam, you look at all the steps, you say, oh yeah, in retrospect, that was not a good idea, I should have done that. In the case of the AI, wherever it says, I think I should have done that instead, it actually makes that change in its code. So far, so good? Okay. Now, if we present the same image again, Assuming it actually did fix a few of its errors in this mixing process, if we now flow the information about these colored pixels forward from its eye to its brain to its mouth again, if it fixed enough things, it's going to guess correctly. This is the most technical part of our time together. So far, so good. Questions? Did I lose anyone? I haven't shown any numbers. We're okay? All right. One of the, arguably one of the most amazing things that's happening in terms of AI or that has happened over the last 10 or 15 years that we have all learned is that if you do this not with just two pictures or three pictures, maybe you throw in a picture of a dog, if we keep doing this with enough images and we tell the AI right, right, wrong, wrong, right, wrong, 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 we do that millions or billions of times, it's amazing what the AI can quote unquote learn. I'm going to put scare quotes around that. Whether the AI learns like humans do or not, that's maybe a discussion for another day. But it certainly gets pretty damn good at it. For a lot of us in the field, and maybe for the general public as well, this is pretty amazing. This is a new piece of knowledge for our society. OK, so far so good? OK, I'm skipping over some slides here. Um, we've just covered sort of what the AI is. Now we're going to talk about how we take that AI and alter it so that it can design organisms. Yeah? Imagine we take an untrained AI. We go back to an AI that tends to just mix things together at random, and we stimulate one of these two numbers down here. We set these numbers in what used to be the mouth of the machine. When it reverses, remember that it's taking these numbers and unpacking them and unmixing them. And in the, in the case of this example that I showed you, it ultimately ends up painting colors back onto the pixels. If you've never seen this before, in the case of an AI that's been trained to recognize cats and dogs, if you treat these two numbers as like keys on a piano and you press the cat key, you're entering that number into the AI, and the AI takes that number and unravels it all the way back to colorized pixels. It's, in essence, splashing paint onto this canvas in what it 
quote unquote thinks is the most cat-like picture it could ever possibly see. So we've now gone from AI to generative AI. We can stimulate part of the brain of this AI and it will generate something. So far so good? Okay. In our case, we don't want it to generate pictures of cats or dogs or uh, text responses to a text prompt. We want it to generate organisms, yeah? How do we do this? We start by making one change, which is that asking this, we're gonna ask this AI not to paint colors onto two-dimensional pixels, but onto three-dimensional voxels. So voxels are just 3D pixels, little boxes. And you can see in my cartoon here that this untrained AI that knows nothing is sort of randomly splashing paint onto some of the voxels in this 3D canvas, this 3D cage. Yeah. You'll notice in this cartoon that there are four different colors, light gray, green, blue, and red. At this point, the AI pauses for a moment and lets some other code take, take over. This other piece of code is gonna act like paint by numbers. I don't know how many of you did this as kids. So a bunch of numbers and you put a color there. We're gonna do this in response. We're gonna bring in a piece of code that basically does the opposite of paint by colors. It's gonna see colors and replace them with numbers. And those numbers are physical constants. It's gonna actually take what at the moment just looks like a 3D painting, and it's gonna to start to treat these 3D pixels, these little cubes, as physical cubes. Things that received uh, light gray paint, those are gonna be scheduled for removal. So we're gonna scrape away or remove all of those gray pixels. You can also sort of think about this as sculpture at this point. The AI has asked for something and we are sort of removing the unwanted material, which leaves us with the red, green, and blue voxels. Yeah. We're gonna take this sculpture at the moment that has these numbers associated with it and we're gonna plug it into a video game. What you're looking at now is a physics engine. And all modern video games are running some version of a physics engine. What is the physics engine doing at this point? It's looking at the blue, uh, the blue cubes and then interpreting those numbers as fat. These, uh, something that is soft and pullable. Could be fat, could be rubber. It's passive material. It can be pulled and pushed by external forces. The green, and, uh, the green and red voxels that you see, the physics engine is simulating them as muscle. Um, it's a little difficult to see in this GIF, but the red voxels, they're actually expanding their volume. They're pushing out against their six sides and then sucking back in again, out, in, out, in. And the green ones are doing the exact same thing, but in antiphase, meaning that the red ones all expand together, and as the red ones are expanding, the green ones are getting smaller. When the green gets big, the, uh, when the green gets big, the red gets small. So far, so good? All in simulation, in a physics engine, and this is what happens. This former sculpture, sculpture comes alive and starts to move a little bit. Doesn't move very far. We're now gonna play a game with this combined AI and video game. We're gonna challenge the AI to find a way to unpack these numbers, to unmix them into a pattern that when we put that pattern in the physics engine, moves as far as possible. So we started by asking the AI to paint a picture in three dimensions. We took that 3D picture, that sculpture, and we animated it in this physics engine. This particular animated sculpture doesn't move forward basically at all. It's not a good design. So far, so good? Okay. So what is the right combination of red, blue, and green that we should paint onto all of these voxels so that this thing pushes and pulls uh, within itself and moves itself forward? This is a rhetorical question. You don't know, I don't know. Super hard. We've, we've asked some human engineers to do this and I had one student say I broke their brain. It's, it's super, super hard to figure out how to do this. 
The AI, however, seems to have no problem. You've heard this term genetic algorithms, so here we go. I want you to take this little piece of code here, this little brain, and now think about it as DNA. DNA encodes information, your brain encodes information, so I'm switching metaphors on you here. But there are a bunch of numbers here that turn these two numbers into this big set of numbers in a random way. The way it does that, think of that as encoded in the DNA. Let's create a second piece of DNA that also encodes random ways of turning these two numbers into, in this case, this pattern. All random, no learning has happened yet, yeah? Two different ways of generating a pattern in three-dimensional space, which results in behavior. This, the following question you should be able to answer, which is better? I heard one vote for bottom. Bottom, right? Okay, hopefully we're all unanimous. It's clear the one at the bottom is the best. The AI is watching both of these and see, comes to the same conclusion. It just measures how far this thing moves in the video game. What does the uh, AI do at that, at that point? It kills off the slower one leaving one survivor. Cruel, but true. What does it do at that point? The AI takes the way these numbers are transformed into these numbers, makes a copy of all those numbers, and as it's making a copy, it introduces a few random changes along the way. What is that starting to sound like? Yeah? As you've already heard, this particular brand of AI is sometimes known as a genetic algorithm or an evolutionary algorithm. It starts by creating random solutions to your problem. In this case, two random solutions. Both are terrible, but one is slightly less terrible than the other. It kills off the really terrible solution. It survives, produces offspring, and sometimes those offspring outperform their parents. Again, for the parents here, some of you have already learned this hard truth, right? <laughs> Our children surpass us. Here we go. Guess what happens on the next slide? One's gone, right? The one in the bottom, see you later, yeah? Okay, so what I've shown you is the genetic algorithm. This is basically what happened on UVM's supercomputer. Um, you know where the whale tails are over on 89? Next time you go past the whale tails, if you look beyond, there's this nondescript building. Inside that nondescript building, there are banks and banks of supercomputers that are basically running this, but they are not simulating two xenobots. They're simulating millions or billions, killing some off, making randomly modified copies in video games. If you went to that building, you went inside, you stuck your head inside the super, supercomputer like in the Matrix, this is what you would see happening. Just way, way faster. Yeah? Okay, that's my side of the contribution to the Xenobot project. We have, now we need to switch gears and get to the biology. As promised, we're gonna stop at 45 minutes. We got 11 minutes left. Let's do the biology. While my group uh, has been working on this for many years now, uh, while this was happening, my two biology colleagues, Doug Blackiston and Michael Levin, were playing with frogs. Here's one of their uh, experiments uh, from 10 years ago now. Doug Blackiston um, is a microsurgeon. He's the one who you're gonna see in a moment builds xenobots. Incredibly talented, doesn't drink coffee, doesn't drink Coke. He can look through the microscope and put together very small amounts of cells into new patterns. Here is one of Doug's, in my opinion, one of his masterworks. He took, as you can see here, a very early frog uh, tadpole. It's got its little tail back here. He did introduce a genetic modification in this case, which was to genetically blind this tadpole. So you'll notice it has no eyes up front. He also made one other alteration, which is when this tadpole was basically in egg form, he took some eye precursor cells. These are a particular kind of stem cell, which in the normal frog develop into frog eyes at the front of the frog's head. Uh, 
But he's placed them in a different place, somewhere where they never show up as tadpoles are developing into frogs. Not only did this surgical intervention not kill the tadpole, this tadpole grew into a perfectly healthy adult frog with an eye on its butt. You gotta love science, right? No eyes on its front, a tail on its butt. This adult frog was perfectly happy and could use the eye on its back to seek food. Yeah? How it does that, these eyes, uh, these eye precursor cells, these stem cells start talking to the spinal cord of the frog and neural processes or synapses or connections or wires start to come from the stem cells and out from the spinal cord. They attach together whatever it is that they're saying to one another and nobody knows. It resulted in this case in a frog that is not quite a frog. Yeah? Okay. How many of you have a problem with this experiment? It's a little problematic, isn't it, right? So before we go any further, and again, this is not my work, I'm not responsible for it, but I think it's worth pausing and asking, was it worth it, yeah? This frog did not have a normal frog life. It had no say in the matter. It was forced upon it, yeah? This is, the next slide is my personal opinion, not my professional opinion. The reason why is this. One of the things that my biology colleagues have been learning from this experiment is that animals are much more suggestible to influence than we originally thought. Plants, if you rotate them, they will respond by growing in a different direction. Most of us were taught in high school biology that frog is encoded in frog DNA and human is encoded in human DNA. Whatever the answer is, that was actually wrong. This is not encoded in the DNA. This is, aside from the genetic blinding, this part at least is genetically unmodified material. We can apparently convince cells and developing organisms to do things and grow things they wouldn't normally do. One offshoot of this work from my colleague Mike Levin in the Levin lab is figuring out how to convince parts of the body to regrow lost structure in a particular species that doesn't normally regrow limbs. Again, this is beyond my area of professional expertise, but this is why those scientists are conducting that animal research. So far, so good? Okay, back to the xenobots. We teamed up with uh, Levin and Blackiston after that experiment. They told us they could rearrange frog cells to produce something that wasn't a frog. They showed us this, which led us to ask the question, if instead of a human surgeon deciding how to move things around, what if we asked an AI to do it? How far could an AI push this rearrangement? In this very first attempt, uh, Doug Blackiston, our microsurgeon, told us that he could work with two materials, frog skin cells, which we're going to represent with these blue cubes in a moment. Frog skin, like your own skin, is passive and soft. It can be pulled and pushed by other parts of your body. Doug also told us we could work with frog heart muscle cells, which as you saw in the video before, uh, heart muscle cells in frogs and in us increase and decrease in volume, increase and decrease in volume, yeah. We explained that to the AI and it started to put together, it started to put together these two different types of cells, blue cells and red slash green cells. You can see in this uppermost uh, attempt, you can see the red-green cells pulling and pushing on the soft blue cells. Here's a different arrangement, here's a different arrangement. This is the evolutionary algorithm or the AI starting all over again with some random guesses. And again, we asked the AI, find a way to put together the blue and the red-green cells to make something that moves from the left to the right as fast as possible. Okay, I've been talking for a long time. Questions, comments? So is one, is one cube or one box right away representing a single cell? 
Good question. Uh, in, at this point, a cube is actually rec representing a bunch of cells. Doug is very talented. He can't quite do things at the single cell level. He can sort of smoosh together patches of cells. Yeah, question. Yep, um, the physics engine, it's called Voxcraft. So voxel, it's the voxel-based version of Minecraft, Voxcraft, yeah? <laughs> you can download it, you can download it and play around with it. It's not a video game, but it's somewhere between a video game and research code, yeah? Yep. Uh, no, it does not simulate a real-world environment. This is very approximate. There's gazillions of things that we did not tell this physics engine about the real world. There's lots of the physics of how these cells actually behave that we didn't give it. So the AI has one arm tied behind its back, which is it knows even less about biology than I do, and that's saying a lot. Yeah. Okay, so things are hard on the AI at this point. Question. In the biological, I, I don't quite understand the question. Yep. Ah, okay, great question. So you're gonna see in a moment, actually let me come back to your question when we get to the manufacturing part. Okay, we run this evolutionary algorithm and after a few weeks of running on the supercomputer, this is what it gave us back. Something that moves from the left to the right side of the bottom of the Petri dish. It's kind of walking along the bottom of a Petri dish, like you might attempt to walk along the bottom of a swimming pool. It's immersed in water. It's the distribution of those cell types and also the 3D shape. You can say, see it's no longer a cube of cubes, yeah? You'll notice it's put the muscle stuff on the ventral or the bottom half of the organism and this, blue passive stuff on the top. We, I've been looking at this video for four years. I understand some of the mechanical engineering physics that's going on here, but definitely not all of it. Maybe, yeah, I think so. Julia, did you have a question? Okay, I, okay, so two questions, okay, let's talk about it. All right, you'll notice that the red-green cells are actually, um, they're not in phase, which means that you'll see some red and then in the same frame of the video, you'll see some green next to it. These things are increasing, decreasing out of phase with one another. Luckily for most of us, not all of us, in your heart, all of your heart cells get bigger together and get smaller together, which means the entire volume of your heart gets bigger and smaller together, which allows your heart to act as a pump. For those of you that have atrial fibrillation or know people that do, that system starts to break down, yeah? So we asked Doug, what happens if we take frog heart cells, rearrange them into something that doesn't look anything like a frog heart? Will, they, will the cells talk to one another and finger, figure out how to synchronize or not? And Doug said, I don't know, nobody's tried it before. So what we told the AI is the worst case. We said, whatever you do, they're gonna disagree. Imagine you tried to design a boat where you, put, you were able to put a whole bunch of human rowers in the boat, but they're not gonna agree with one another. They're gonna just do their own thing at their own frequency, but the boat has to go forward straight, yeah? It's a very, very, it's a very difficult problem, but apparently not impossible, yeah? Humans, at least, I haven't met a human yet that can do this, the AI can do it. Uh, have we tried without the skin cells? Um, for, for various reasons, Doug told us that he can't make something just from heart cells. He has to use the skin as almost like a support material for, for various reasons. Okay, we're running really short on time, so let me get to the punchline, yeah? Okay. All right, this is the AI's best guess. We sent that video to Doug Blackiston, the microsurgeon, and now Doug is gonna try and attempt to build it. First thing he does is extract uh, these cells from a frog egg, which snuffs out this particular frog's life. 
What you're looking at now is after this point, you can see the individual frog cells. He's placed them in a little small well in the bottom of the Petri dish. They're sort of coalescing together. And you'll notice that the cells don't like to be on their own. This is not, there's a bit of random motion here. They're also being sloshed around by the liquid. But there's also some non-random motion. The cells are making some decisions on their own. They don't like what's happening. And they're trying to do something, which at the moment is just glom together. This is, I'm jumping ahead in the process. This is towards the end. Uh, our previous uh, speaker mentioned uh, the, the sculpture David. Here's our frog sculpture here. You'll notice Doug has flipped the Xenobot on its back and he's scraping away some of the material. At this point, it's got four legs. It's gonna reduce it to the two legs that he saw in the video. This is him trying to basically manufacture, a, build a copy of this. Remember, this is a millimeter across. Imagine looking through a microscope with millimeter-sized tools and trying to sculpt into a poppy seed. Way to go, Doug, okay. All right, we already talked about hearts. Doug almost had a heart attack, taking this thing, a lot of effort went into this, flipped it onto its legs, and this is the video he was able to record. What you're seeing in the bottom is the world's first AI-designed organism. It's sped up four times, so it moves four times as slowly as that um, in the dish. It also doesn't look exactly like what the AI dreamed up, but it was close enough that the physical and the simulated or video game Xenobot both did the same thing. This proved to us that an AI could dream up or design or optimize something that's pretty fantastical. There's a lot of things here that aren't realistic, but it's good enough that if you get a very, very talented human uh, uh, microsurgeon he can build it. Okay. I had some more slides to show, but we're out of time. So um, let's talk about applications. We have a spin-off company now called Fauna Systems, as in flora and fauna. Uh, we're talking to uh, plant-based meat companies, cultured meat companies. Imagine xenobots moving through cultured meat and fixing things here and there. Uh, here's a vertical farm. Uh, these are plants with running water underneath. One thing that people that run vertical farms want to know is what's going on inside the root system of that plant. Xenobots are perfectly happy in room temperature fresh water. They might be used for this inspection task. We mentioned when we published the paper pulling microplastics out of the ocean or maybe someday pulling microplastics out of your brain because unfortunately that's where they are currently being lodged. Maybe the gray goo will happen, but hopefully not on this planet, maybe another planet, who knows. Uh, we are looking at generalizing this technology beyond frogs to other species. It might become possible to make anthrobots, biobots that are made from human cells. If we can, it might become possible, who knows when or if, to make biobots or bots from your own cells. If they're introduced into your body, it would sidestep the immune response because according to your body, it's you. It's literally you. Whether any of these applications will pan out, your guess is as good as mine. We'll see what happens. Let me finish by thanking the people that actually did the real work. I mentioned Sam Kriegman already in my lab, David Matthews, who helped out with this project as a UVM undergraduate. Let me thank my two biology colleagues. Let me thank the Department of Defense that funded this money. You all, if you're a taxpayer, you fund the Department of Defense. So thank you for funding this work. Thanks for your attention today. There's time. What's the defense department's interest in the 
Oh boy, okay, yeah, this is an inevitable question. Uh, again, uh, so first of all, I'm a Canadian citizen, which means I can know a very small fraction of what they have in mind. Uh, I don't know. In this particular project, uh, they were funding AI, so they didn't fund Xenobots because no one knew Xenobots were possible. They were funding um, AI that would learn on the job. So at the moment, all of the AI that's running on your phone, that's running in autonomous cars, for various reasons, most of the time that AI does not try and learn on the job, because as you saw in my slides, if you learn on the job, you're likely to make mistakes. But we all learn on the job. We have to survive on this planet, stay relatively well-fed and well-sheltered, and learn new stuff. So the Department of Defense, six years ago, created a program called Lifelong Learning Machines. They love acronyms. This was the L2M program. They funded all sorts of roboticists, AI folks, biologists, and they tried to push the techies together with the biologists to say, look it, biology knows how to learn on the job. Our machines aren't very good at learning on the job. Figure out from the biologists how organisms do this and put that into our machines. And this ended up being our contribution to that program. Um, it gives me confidence that this technology is possible. It's now possible that the AI can do it. I was poking fun at that politician because that, in that specific case, that's not what ChatGPT is doing. I'm not confident that this technology will generalize and allow us to pull microplastics out of our brains. I don't know where this technology will go. Again, I'm biased, but I think it's worth pursuing it to see what it can and can't do, and then we should all try and figure out, if we can, how to regulate this technology. Again, not a trivial thing to do, but that's not something for the scientists to decide. That's for all of us to decide. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Doreen Kraft, the director of BCA, up. And one thought while she's coming up, uh, the front door is actually broken. So when you leave, um, tonight we will all be leaving through the back door. We're not leaving. We're not leaving. <laughs> no. Um, Chris, thank you so much. Um, there are so many people to thank for this extraordinary day. I feel like we're just getting started learning about all this unchartered territory that we're in. Um, I thank you for taking the time out of your weekend to be with us. Um, let's continue. I think there's a real society of people who really care about the arts role in this um, new world, very brave. Um, and I think we're going to have some um, deep learning that will continue and also some fun. Um, let's keep the artist at the center of this discussion. Let's make sure that they remain there. That's one way we know that it's going to continue to be um, something fascinating and something that is always about discovery. Um, I'd like to thank um, Chris Thompson, uh, who did a phenomenal job in the curation of this event, along with Jen Carson. Um, let's give them a hand. <laughs> I'd like to thank Heather Farrell, our curator at Burlington City Arts, who brings great th thought and great people to the foreground in guest curation and does great work for our city. Where are you, Heather? There you are. Heather, thank you. I want to thank our sponsors. Hula was amazing. Did you like being here? Yeah? It's okay. Maybe next time we you know, move to another place, or should we always be here? What do you think? You like it here? Okay. It's expensive. God damn it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd like to thank our um, underwriters, the University of Vermont, the College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences, the um, university's uh, Office of the Vice President for Research, 
Gravel and Shea are partners at uh, UVM, the School of the Arts, and the National Science Foundation. Thank you so much again for being with us today. And join us back at BCA if, as Chris said, if you haven't had a chance to see the show, it's phenomenal. So thanks again. <laughs>